Today we begin a two-part series focusing on signs of the end times. Part one this week, part two next week, and we'll be taking a look into Mark chapter 13. These are not my words, these are the words of Jesus. We're going to learn about the end times. Let's learn from the Master, and the Master is Jesus himself. And so let's jump right into his words and begin to break this down. Chapter 13, verse 1. As Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. So Jesus' disciples are, are walking by the temple, Herod's temple. Josephus calls it one of the greatest wonders ever built. These stones were huge. He describes them as being 60 to 80 feet in length, 40 feet in width, and 40 feet in diameter. Those are huge stones. Just imagine trying to put those stones in place, one on top of another. And you're looking at this place, you're thinking nothing could ever tear this place down. But Jesus says, not one stone will be left on top of another. And Jesus is laying out what's going to happen within the lifetime of some of these disciples. The Jews are going to rebel. And they're going to go into Jerusalem and be surrounded. And of 1.1 million people in the city, as Josephus records, only 75,000 are going to survive. Through death, by fighting, but also through starvation. As they are surrounded, they have they run out of food. Some people revert to cannibalism. It was a terrible time in history. It was all said and done. The city was destroyed. The temple was completely demolished. Jesus is laying out what's going to happen before it happens. He goes on to verse 3. And he sat on the Mount of Olives, opposite the temple. Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately. Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he. And they will lead many astray. So Jesus is going to begin to lay out the details of the signs of the end times. In particular, more things in the time frame of the disciples here, but it's also going to lay out a frame for us too. But more important than the details of these signs, and a lot of people get obsessed with the signs of the end times, is what Jesus is telling us to do in preparation for the end times. And here he's being very specific. Do not let anyone lead you astray. There's going to be people coming saying that they're the Messiah trying to say that they have the right answer for life and for eternity. And even in this day and age, we have people who think they have all the answers. And people trying to lead people away from Jesus. And that's how Satan works. He does not want people to worship Jesus. And we look at our society, and more and more people are turning away from Christianity. That's a terrible heartbreak. I can't imagine how it breaks God's heart. But we need to realize that a lot of people are being led astray by false teachings, by worldly things that are only temporary. They're falling into traps. They're falling into addictions. We're all designed to serve someone. We're designed to worship someone. But yet so often people worship the wrong things, the wrong people, the wrong ideals, the wrong fads. And they worship their addictions and things that destroy them and put them into bondage. And Jesus is saying, don't be led astray by the things of this world. Keep focused. Keep focused on me. How do we know what's of the world and what's of God? And we have his word. And what we need to do is grow in the word and be able to compare what's in the word to what we see being taught in the world. If it's not in the word, then it's wrong. It's a wrong direction. Everything needs to be confirmed by the word of God. And God's Spirit will help us in this process. Do not be led astray. He goes on in verse 7. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. 
This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Stop right there. Wars and rumors of wars. Is this something new? No. This has been going on for centuries. People think the Old Testament is so violent, and it was. But think about this. You'd be reading through a couple chapters in the Old Testament, and there's a war going on, and then one verse says there's 40 years of peace. Then another war starts, and it goes on for a while. And then it says there's 80 years of peace. When's the last time we had 40 years of peace or 80 years of peace in our country? Wars are going on all the time. Nation rising its nation. One nation takes power, another one destroys it and brings it down. It cycles around and around and around. And right now we're called the most powerful nation in the world. My concern is that we continue in the path that we're going on and push God out of our society more and more. I think we're heading for a crash because the power of the universe is found in, in God. And he wants a world of freedom. And we have this country based upon freedom. That's why it works. But when freedoms are taken away, watch out what's going to happen. But wars, rumors of war, this is nothing new. It goes on. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. Earthquakes, famines, been around a long time. In the time of the disciples, our time even today. But these are birth pains. These are signs. Nine, but be on your guard. Okay, again, God, through his word, gives us direction. And Jesus here, once again, first of all, he says, do not be led astray. Now be on your guard. Be alert. Be awake. Be aware of what's happening around you. Be aware of what's happening inside of you. We live in a world of entertainment. The word amusement, the word muse means to shut down your mind. That's Satan's ploy for our minds to be shut down. We get in these routines. We get into ruts. And so if we're blind to what's really happening around us and inside of us as we're gradually led astray. Look what's happening to our society. It's like the frog and the kettle. You put the frog in the kettle, you turn the heat on, and as the water gets hotter, that frog sits there until it gets cooked. That's happening in our society. and We can't get cooked by the world. We need to be focusing on the Word of God, to be aware of what's happening, not just outside of us and around us, but inside of us as well. Because so often our minds get messed up. Be aware of what you're thinking about. Make sure your thoughts and your actions are focused on the Word of God. And so often that's challenging for us. And we get these ruts like, you know, sometimes I'm driving down Hayden Road, I'm, I'm heading to you know, the store, and I drive right past it because I'm so used to driving here to Holy Cross. I come to Holy Cross, wait a second, I was going to the store. So used to the routines in our lives. But to be aware, to be alert. And we see this time and time again in preparation for the second coming. It goes on. For they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues. And you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. This is talking more to the disciples because this is going to happen. They're going to stand before councils and leaders, church leaders, government officials. Terrible things are going to happen. They're going to be persecuted for their faith. All of them are going to die for their faith, except for John, who's going to be banished on the island of Patmos. Jesus tell them what's going to happen before it happens, so when it does happen, they realize, okay, this is what's supposed to happen. But even in the situations that they're going to be in, they are going to take advantage to share the gospel with the leaders of the world. You know, think about Paul. and We think about his big vision. His vision was for the gospel to reach the whole world. It says here, the gospel must be proclaimed to the entire world, then the end will come. I'm convinced that Paul had in his mind that he was going to be used by God to make that happen in his lifetime, and he nearly did. His goal was to get to Rome, because he wanted to get to Caesar. He figures, if I can get to Caesar, and he comes to faith, then the whole world is going to come to faith. And along the way, he met with other kings and leaders. And every time he took the advantage of that to share the gospel, figured if I can 
influence leaders to share the truth and to believe, then they can influence many others. Talking about a big vision, that was Paul's vision. Unfortunately for him, he's going to die in Rome. But a few hundred years later, one of the Roman emperors, Constantine, is going to come to faith. And at that point, almost the whole world becomes Christian. And Rome becomes a center for Christianity. And so having a big vision is so important. And we see that terrible things are going to happen. And I think it's even happening more and more in our lifetime. Christianity, more and more, I feel is being persecuted being persecuted in the parts of the world, for sure. It's the most persecuted religion in the world. But even more in our country, people seem to be turning against Christianity. Not just falling away from it, but turning against it. But the gospel is proclaimed the entire world. So of all the signs, the one that seems to be the most clear is this, that before the end comes, the gospel must be proclaimed the entire world. The question is, how close are we for that to happen? And I think we're getting pretty close. I mean, no matter where you go in the world, you're going to find a computer. Even internet cafes in third world countries. If you have access to a computer, you have access to anything, including the gospel. So I think more and more the gospel is being proclaimed. It doesn't say that right when that happens, it's going to happen right away. But before the end happens, the gospel must first be proclaimed to the entire world. We read on verse 11. And when they bring you to trial, And deliver you over. Do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say. But say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death. And father his child. And children will rise against parents. And have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. Wow. Everyone realize that becoming a Christian is... Not an easy journey. We're going to be hated. And I think it's going to happen more and more with time. But yet in the end, what's more important? Our popularity or the truth? And I think so many people, they compromise the truth because they're more concerned about their popularity. But in the end, what matters? Do people believe in Jesus or not? That is the bottom line. But the promise that Jesus gives is that he's going to give us the right words to say at the right time. The Holy Spirit's going to direct us not to worry what to say. And the disciples, you look at their lives and you look at the amazing things they accomplished. Even in the face of death. The Christian life can be challenging. But in the end, we know where we're going. There is no death. There's life here and there's life in heaven. And what we see you know, through the teachings of Jesus, but also in Revelation, the importance of sharing our faith with others. And if we stand before leaders, what a great opportunity for us to do that. No matter who we stand in front of, to speak the truth. Because in the end, it's the truth that sets us free. But even family members turning against family members. In fact, I was reading about a situation in World War II in Germany, where a German citizen, a man, was standing up for freedom. And he was imprisoned, he was beaten. He was almost beaten to the point of death. But he withstood, he stood firm to the view of freedom. They eventually let him go. But a short time after he was set free, he committed suicide. And people are thinking, why would he commit suicide when he was set free? But the people close to him realized what happened. When he got out of the prison camp, he found out it was his son who turned him in. And that was more than he could handle, emotionally. Because when the most loved ones turn against you, that's sometimes the most difficult thing. But this is going to happen. But we need to stand firm. That's what the last verse says here. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. If you endure to the end, you will be saved. And how do we endure? Through faith. By the power that Jesus will give us. The strength he gives us at the right time. His spirit living in us. When I was in high school, I was a cross-country runner. And those three-mile races were brutal. And sometimes towards the end of the race, I was just completely wore out. And, you know, for my whole cross-country career, there's always somebody better than me. And the first two years, the state champion was on our team. And finally, my senior, I thought, about my year to finally win some races. But another runner came up from our team over the years who actually a year younger than me that became a superstar his junior year when I was a senior. He was winning every race. 
And one time we're running, it was 100 degrees in Minnesota of all places, hot. And he was way out ahead like normal. And I was behind by probably, I don't know, 100 yards, me and another friend of mine that was on the team. And right before the finish line, he stops and he's motioning for us to come up. We all run up to him. He says, we're going to go across the finish line together. And we did. That was the only time I ever won a race. He shared the victory with me. And you see, Jesus shares victory with us. He's the only perfect person to live on this planet. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross. He rose again. And through believing in him, he shares a victory with us. And the victory is secured even right now as we're going through this life. We know we're going. We know we're victorious. Nothing can defeat us. And that can help us in the midst of the challenge we face. We know that the future is secure in Christ. And even if things are tough now, we're going to get through it. He's going to help us through it. And he can bring good out of anything bad. And that's the hope we have as we journey through this life in the midst of the challenges that we face. And holding fast to the things that Jesus shares with us. Yes, there's different signs of the end times, but more importantly, what we're supposed to do, not be led astray to be on our guard, but know that by enduring to the end, that we will be saved. Not by what we do, but by what he has done for us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we look forward to your return. We don't know what it's going to be. The signs that are revealed are signs that we've seen all around us for centuries. But the one about sharing that the gospel must be proclaimed to the entire world, Obviously, that's getting close, but help us to contribute to that by sharing your word more boldly in what we say and do. But Lord, help us to not be led astray. Help us to be on our guard, to be aware of what's going on around us, inside of us, and help us, Lord, in the midst of challenges to endure, knowing you're with us every step of the way, that through you, we truly are saved. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.